Hi, I'm Francoise Rhodes and this is Traveling with Francoise. On today's episode, we are taking Interstate 10 from Palm Springs to Banning, the old stagecoach town. Along the way, we will hear rushing waters, we'll be on tribal land, and we'll see more flashing lights that you can imagine. So come on, let's go, let's hit the highway of Interstate 10. Want to travel? I'll take you there. Want to dine? I'll tell you where to play golf. I'll pick the spot and I like it. It's never too late to get a life. Transcontinental Interstate 10 serves the southern tier of the United States by providing the main east-west link from Santa Monica and the desert southwest to Jacksonville and the southeastern United States. This route is known as the Christopher Columbus Transcontinental Highway, and it is one of the three coast-to-coast -coast interstates. Within California, Interstate 10 leaves the greater Los Angeles metropolitan area some 70 miles east of downtown Los Angeles. I-10 enters the desert just beyond the narrow San Gorgonio Pass. Beyond there, the freeway becomes characteristic of a rural desert, one it will retain through much of its journey through the West. Major desert cities in California include Palm Springs, Indio, and Blythe. Then across the country, I-10 ending some 2,400 miles away in Jacksonville, Florida's largest city. But our first stop is the Whitewater Preserve in Whitewater. Are you tired of the shopping and the laying by the pool, playing tennis and golf, and you want to do something completely different? Maybe go to a place where you can relax, look at the beautiful blue ponds here, filled with trout, hear some rushing water, and look around at the gorgeous trees. Well, how about the Whitewater Preserve? Off of the I-10 on exit 114, you drive about five miles into the canyon and you will be pleasantly surprised at this paradise that awaits you. A former trout hatchery, now a preserve, a beautiful conservancy here in the canyons of our Southern California deserts. There are trails here that you can connect right here from the Whitewater Preserve that will take you from Mexico to Canada. Incredible. But this preserve here is 2,800 acres, which is just really a small portion of the Southern California Wildlife Conservancy. So let's walk over and see what kind of trails you might want to take, unless you just want to sit at one of the picnic benches and have lunch, maybe lay by a pond, dream about catching trout, or just enjoying the beautiful weather up here at the Whitewater Preserve in the canyons outside of Palm Springs. Now inside the preserve, a lot of people don't realize not only do you have the beautiful ponds here camping, they have picnic areas, there's also four designated trails. And one of the trails actually leads to the Pacific Crest National Scenic Trail, which is 2,900 miles from Mexico to Canada. But you don't have to go that far. You can actually take the Canyon View Loop Trail, which is only 3.5 miles, a moderate trail. Of course, they have four mile trips and an eight mile hike one way. Most of these trails are easy to moderate, but you want to be dressed and prepared. Bring plenty of water, wear your hat, sunscreen and comfortable walking shoes. The Whitewater River is a small permanent stream in western Riverside County, California, with a small upstream section in southwestern San Bernardino County and has three significant tributaries, the North, Middle and the South Forks, all within the Sand to Snow National Monument. If you're hoping to catch a little bit of the wildlife here at the Whitewater Preserve, they have this telescope for the public to use. It's free. And I'm going to zoom in on the birds in the trees up there. It looks like they're building a nest. All of this and more at the Whitewater Preserve right up here. Again, just minutes from downtown Palm Springs. Welcome back to Traveling with Francoise. Everyone knows where the Cabazon outlet stores are off the 10 freeway, but there's also a sign that says Malky Road. Now, if you get off on the Malky Road, bypass the Cabazon outlet stores, it will take you into the Morongo Indian Reservation and right here to the Malky Museum. We're inside the Malky Museum, which will look a little bit small to you, but thanks to director Jasmine Gonzalez, there is an abundance of information here. So, Jasmine, please start us with the founders. So, we have uh, Jane Penn here and Catherine Siva, along with Dr. Lowell Bean. 
Uh, Jane Pan was uh, the primary founder of the museum along with Catherine Siva Sabo, who was our president until she died in 2009. Uh, both women had plenty of artifacts donated to them from their families. They decided to open a museum and show the local community and their fellow tribal members about uh, their ancestors and the way of living. It started off in Jane Penn's home, which is uh, east of the museum, and eventually they opened up the facility which we're in today in 1972. Oh. The little hidden museum off the 10 freeway. Well, it is a little yeah. hidden museum, but there's so many interesting artifacts here. And I think I'd like to start out with you telling us about the baskets. Every basket has a different story. Um, certain baskets have uh, thunder and lightning, which signify here, if you ever look at the Morongo logo, you see that their their logo is thunder and lightning, and that signifies, it's a basket design. And you see the rattlesnake, we have plenty of rattlesnakes out here in the desert. And that's the circular coil in the middle. You can actually see the rattlesnake's head and the rattler at the end. At yes. first, you know what, Jasmine, when I first glanced at the baskets, all I saw was, to me, just artwork, yeah. not realizing that each basket tells a story. Yeah. And we have other baskets, too, that signify mountains, wind, rainbows. So anything that was out here, you'll see in a lot of the different baskets. You see birds, you see flocks of geese, um, arrow points. It is a very complex yes. process. Do they game. still make these baskets today? Yes, so they still make baskets today. There are very few basket weavers, but they are growing in numbers. So the older generations, the elders, are teaching the younger generations. And so aside from being just Malki Museum, we're also Malki Bellina Press and we do publish a majority of these books that we have for sale here. All right, Jasmine, now the museum here, the Malcolm Museum, is open to the public. Yes, we and are. How many days a week are you open? We're open five days a week, Tuesday through Saturday, and our hours are set 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. All right, and then pottery. Pottery is such a huge part of the culture of the United States, the, the tribes, and tell us, the, all this pottery here is from different tribes, the same tribe? Tell us a little bit about that. So um, the pottery you see in here, it's all from different regions. And the way you would identify this if you were an archeologist out in the field is um, by looking at the color and also at the structure of the, um, of the pottery. So if you were to want to identify pottery that is from the Malki area, mm -hmm. the San Gregorio Pass, you look at the orange tint. Oh. Out in the Agua Caliente area, it's more gray, the darker color. So here inside the Malki, we have baskets, we have pottery, we have a bow and arrow that's incredible. We also have a little bit more about the founders and the history of the Malki Museum. But there's also a garden outside, which to me is fascinating because we look around our desert and think there's nothing to eat out there, but there are a lot of things to eat and a lot of ways to survive. So we're going to head on out into the garden, and the name of the garden is? Temelpak from the earth. Temelpak. So Jasmine, describe to us what is this structure next to you? So here we have a quiche, and this is where the Kawea people traditionally lived, and that you can see they use uh, material that's available in the desert, which is the California palm fronds. Um, and they're stacked up on a wood on the inside and you create the dome shape and this is where they would sleep. This is their house. But this is a mini version. Yes, this is a miniature version of the traditional Kawea housing. This is a storage facility for food and we're standing right next to a huge mesquite tree which we're going to describe how all this plays into living again out in the Southern California desert. Now this is a refrigerator. <laughs> yes, basically it is. It's a storage facility and so um, these uh, granaries were used uh, for storing any dry goods, so your acorns, your mesquite, your uh, jojoba, anything that you harvested during the fall so you can store it over the winter or while into the summer. Um, and it is made out of willow, so when desert willow is fresh, it's very flexible, you can twist it and um, weave it into each other and then you have your storage granary here. Today's technology, we're, we're very spoiled. Now yes. right here is a mesquite tree and also in the the garden here there's creosote there's salt brush there's several different species of plant life in the desert that again people survived yeah. that's how they live so tell us a little bit what did uh, what was the mesquite tree used for so the mesquite tree you would use the beans that it gives off in the fall 
in order uh, to supply you with flour and you can make little cakes out of it like a cracker. Um, today modern day we do mesquite pancakes. It's a great substitute for regular flour. Now agave, everyone talks about agave plants for medicine, for uh, I don't know for lotion, uh, but agave is a huge part of the Cahuilla people and their survival out in the yes. desert. And you have a couple examples over here. Okay. And I noticed a lot of metates all over the ground and those are the grinding stones and the, yes. the little pots. We'll have to show some of these but you mm -hmm. have these spread out all throughout the garden here, the matates. Yes. So now this right here is an agave cactus. To me it looks like a cactus. Yes. Yeah. So it is a desert agave. It's a breed of agave, agave desert tie and it is a century plant so once it blooms it dies but it's it's the giving plant. And how long does it take for it to mature where the plants start coming out? Anywhere from 15 to 20 years. That's a long time waiting to eat the agave. Yes. <laughs> that is a long time. Uh, Jasmine, how many different species of plants do we have out here at the Malki Museum um, in the garden? About 28 different species of plants. Um, we have three different species of yucca. We have agave. We have three, four different types of sage. I really want our viewers to remember that the Malki Museum is open to the public. And with that said, you have a lot of events that happen here year round. Oh yes, we have three major events a year. We do our agave harvest, so you come out with us for, uh, for one weekend, you go out and harvest agave the following weekend. We have an event here at the museum, which is the agave tasting. And so you'll get to taste the agave that we've harvested. Um, we also do other native foods, such as rabbit stew, mesquite pancakes, and we also cook deer if we have it. So you get a taste of what natives had, had to eat. And all that information is on your website? Yes. And you'll see that at the bottom of the screen. And so again, Jasmine, thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to Traveling with Francoise. Back on the I-10 we go to the city of Banning in Riverside County. It is situated in the San Gorgonio Pass, also known as Banning Pass. It is named for Phineas Banning, stagecoach line owner and the father of the Port of Los Angeles. Initially, Banning served as a stagecoach and railroad stop between the Arizona Territories and Los Angeles. The town of Banning was incorporated on February 6, 1913. Between the years 1880 and 1980, it was the largest city in year-round population between Redlands and the Colorado River. But we're here in Banning to visit the Museum of Pinball. If you're like me, we're all a kid at heart. But in today's world of technology, you have to wonder, is the pinball machine coming back or is it going out of style? Well, we're here in Banning, California at the Museum of Pinball. 40,000 square feet, over 1,100 machines. This is a sensory overload right here at the Museum of Pinball and really a fun place to visit. I'm gonna tell you how you can visit this and I have the expert join us. The fellow who founded this, what made him want to collect all these pinball machines in arcade games? Well, we're gonna find out. Well, joining us here at the Museum of Pinball is the founder, John Weeks. Okay, now my first question to you, and a lot of people are thinking this, is this a hobby, an obsession, or a business? It's a little bit of all that above. It's everything. Obviously, it must be coming back into style with all the technology. What are you finding? I'm finding that out, that it's a, uh, been a big resurgence of pinball machines, and uh, a lot of uh, locations now have pinball, but nothing quite like this. Over here, we have over a 1,000 pinball machines in arcade games to play at once. It takes over 45 minutes just to power up all the machines. There's just so many breakers and so many spots to power them up. What got you started in collecting pinball and arcade machines? Well, I ran an arcade back in the early 80s, and then around the mid 2000s, I started getting back into it by accident. I wanted to just put like one or two in my house, and then one day uh, I got a fell swoop of like 25 machines, and then I said, wow, okay, uh, this is amazing. <laughs> And then it just kept going on and on and on. One day I, I, I came across this building and that's where we've installed the uh, Museum of Pinball. Well, and yeah. folks, the Museum of Pinball is in Banning, California. Uh, maybe a little bit off the beaten path, but I think you probably like it that way. We're the same distance from San Diego as we are from downtown LA. So it's really kind of a perfect location. And then we get even people from Phoenix, Arizona can just drive here. We have people that 
fly from all over the world to come here when we have an event to play the pinball machines and arcade games. Okay, now each pinball machine has a story. They have a theme, a story. They all do different things. Mm -hmm. How old is your oldest machine? We have one machine from the 1840s, mm. but it's in the showcase. Okay, and nobody can touch it. Yeah, mm -hmm. nobody can touch that machine, but it's. That's an incredible machine, and that's where the name pinball comes from, because it actually has pins in it. Let's talk about these three machines right here. You have Dark Knight, Iron Man, and Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. They all are completely different. Are pinball machines, do they have their own categories? or? They're just, there's different styles. These are the newer styles here, the ones that are kind of like brand newish. Every machine has a different theme, different gameplay, different artwork and they all have their own personality. And one thing they all have in common is the silver ball. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's <laughs> now, right. is there only one silver ball? But don't some pinball machines have five or six or? Some of them do, they come a multi-ball. You could be playing this game, and, and if you've never played pinball before like these, you could be playing and all of a sudden, like, for instance, this machine, eight pinballs will start coming at you. It just becomes mo a wild, uh, a wild game. Not that I want to date myself, John, but this is the type of pinball machine that I grew up playing with the bumpers and the lights and the little flippers, completely different than all the high tech of today. So tell us a little bit about these machines, how old they are without giving my age away, by okay. the way. <laughs> and then let's talk about the, the back glass here. Those have evolved so much through time. I'm yes. sure when they started making these machines that the technology, uh, there was just a lot more involved. That's that's correct. Uh, you're right, Francois. Um, these these back glasses here were uh, uh, not the new one. Not that the new ones are not a work of art either, but these back glasses here are all done with four color mechanical color separation. So basically, they're not done like today, like on Photoshop stuff like that, where something can be just put together. Not to say per se really quickly, but back then they had to use you know knives, ruby loop, zipatone, all kinds of. For what would take back then would take uh, two to three months to make a back glass. Now they could probably do it in two to three days. These machines are from the mid 60s <laughs> and uh, they're a little bit less complicated. A lot of people stay away from them, the, the, the younger crowd, because they look kind of boring, but in fact they're quite neat. And there is a lot of uh, different tricks and rules of these games. And these ones you can get more involved in the motion of the machines by just, you know, you can move them more, they got more play, you can, you know, what they call tilting, because when you tilt them, the game's over. But if you know just how far to tilt the game, you can take an advantage on the machine by just moving a little bit like this or that. And these machines are quite unique, and, and each one's a, a piece of work of, of history and art. Well, I think that is a huge part of the fun of pinball. You mm. brought it up right there, is being able to know how far you can push a machine. Even mm. with today's technology, mm. I, yeah, want, I will admit, and once in a while <laughs> I'd walk by and kind Shooter. of bump it so when I was in competition to tilt for the other person, but we won't talk about that. All right. Now, we will talk about that the back face here, and a couple of them are the same. They're identical, but they're different machines. Yes, correct. They did, uh, to save costs back in the old days, they would just theme them out differently. Maybe some were made for an export market out of the out of the United States. They would want to change it up a little bit or something like that. How many series of pinball machines have been made through the years? Oh gosh, I can't even tell you. It's thousands. I think tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. So here is just a, a representation of probably you know one twentieth of what was ever made as far as different styles. Now we're going to go over and look at something that's very large That's in the right. world of pinball machines. That's right, we're going to the big granddaddy of them all. Okay. Big monster. Now before I get too distracted, John, playing Hercules, tell us about this gigantic pinball machine. <laughs> well, if this is the largest machine uh, ever made. It's just super, super big. Um, you can see us standing next to it. It's just the massive size of it compared to this one here. Um, it's, it's really fascinating when a child comes up and we had to put a step stool down. You should see the look on the face of a child when they first step up to this machine. And what's the bigger draw, the smaller or I, something like Hercules? <laughs> this is a big draw for, for uh, well, excuse me. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Lots <laughs> of noise going, days, going on noise here. Going, but <laughs> this machine's a big draw because it's just, you walk up to it and you go, wow, I didn't realize something this large would be in a pinball machine. It's just. It's just massive in size. And the ball is, compared to a normal pinball size, mm -hmm. what is the size of the ball? This is the size of a cue ball, so just like uh -huh. a pool table ball. All right. So it just takes all the energy just to push that ball up to the top. And it's over 40 years old and it's still working today. It's amazing. Well, it's a lot of fun, but I think now from Hercules, we really ought to go over and see where pinball machines actually started. Okay. 
Okay. And here we are as we were talking with John Weeks, the founder of the Museum of Pinball. Yeah. Now, John, we were just over at Hercules. Right. <laughs> gigantic. We've seen Huge. old machines, new machines, but we have to talk about this is a pinball machine right here. Explain this to us. Well, this is a really old pinball machine. It's from the mid-1800s. And as you can see, it's just a real simple thing. It's just a piece of wood. It's not very big, maybe about a, a foot and a half, two feet high. And compared to Hercules, it's like <laughs> the big difference. But it is a pinball machine because it's got the points, it's got the pins, the ball launches just like the new ones. This is how a pinball machine was probably started. Quite incredible. It really is. And I think I could see where a lot of kids back in the day mm -hmm. would love. How old is this? Gosh, this is 1850. 1850? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, wow. <laughs> and as, as we're looking in this glass case, we see a canceled check from your first arcade, John's first arcade, mm -hmm. 1979 to 1980. I think the check is for $12. Yeah. yeah. Well, back then, $12. Today is probably like $50. Who knows? Yeah. But uh, that's when we had the first arcade, and that's that's our bank deposits when we, you know, kind of like just some stuff I found that we had left over from there. So we just put it in the, in the showcase in the, in the museum. Well, I'm sure it brings back a lot of memories every time oh, yeah. you walk by and look at that. <laughs> oh, wow, it does, yes. John, from pinball machines to arcade machines, this room here, this is a separate room of the museum, yes. full of arcade games. Tell yes. us a little bit, what are we seeing here? These are all old arcade games, uh, starting in the late 70s, going all up to the present day. But uh, these machines are all classic and, uh, you know, well sought out to play. Everybody loves playing these games. They're, they kind of go hand in hand with pinball machines. People that played pinball also played arcade games. Some of these machines I've never seen. Zybots. Zybots is uh, what it is. Zybots. We have Escape Robot Monsters from the planet of the Robot right. Monsters. Yeah. Atari. I'm noticing the name Atari a lot. Were they well, the premier arcade game maker? Correct, yeah. This is the actual Atari section. So we kind of section the games by the manufacturer. This whole block here is all Atari. Then we have some that are called Midway. There's just different makers of, of arcade games. We keep them all together. Did, Big Doug, yes, it's, it's a classic. Yeah. A, a classic right game. here. Yeah. Uh, kind of. And I don't know anything about. I don't know anything about arcade games. Yeah. but Pac-Man is that sort of a. Pac-Man's kind of common and popular. We have Pac-Man, of course. We have all mm -hmm. the games. A lot of the the, the harder to find games to play. Uh, we have certain people play these games as a as a child. Now they're a little older like us, and they want to come back and relive their, their youth. Well, relive here's their youth. a little known fact. I just was reading about this the other day, that Las Vegas now is actually making their slot machines more like arcade games yep. because people are bored with sitting there doing nothing. Right. They want to play them. They want interaction, something to uh, win, something to beat. Now, the cost of an arcade game back, let's say, 30 years ago oh, today, yeah. how, how much does it cost to play a typical arcade? This is 25 back, cents. It, it was a quarter back then. Today, you might pay 50 to 75 cents for some of the newer games. I've been to some of the new arcades, and they're like, yeah. actually, you really don't know what you're paying because they put them on a card, and you just oh. <laughs> you put 20 bucks, and you swipe your card. You have no clue what you're paying. You just keep yeah. going and going yeah, yeah, and going yeah, yeah. Until, until you, you know, score. Until you, you get no the clue. high yeah. score, yeah. and they keep. So we can yeah. walk down and look okay. at some of these. And right. the colors, the screens. I know Notice that the screens, though, are all about the same size. Some of these are like 19 inch, they call them. Some are 25 inch. And then, you know, they've even got set down ones where you kind of set into the uh, arcade games, and even those are, are very interactive when you're setting in it, feeling the machine. All right. Yeah. And here at the Museum of Pinball, how many arcade games do you have? I'm going to say it's over 600 arcade games. It's crazy. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. Our viewers out there are saying, how can I go to the right. Museum of Pinball? How can I put my hands on these machines, right. on the pinball machines, on right. the arcade games? Right. Well, we're going to find out how in just a second. Awesome. All right, on St. Patrick's Day weekend, this area right here is going to become the gift shop for a big event here at the Museum of Pinball. Mm -hmm. Behind me, John, is the ultimate pinball wall. Did you design this? <laughs> yeah, I designed yeah. it and made this, yes. <laughs> and then you have the lights over there. Yes. Those look very old. They're old. They're from an old church from the 60s, I imagine. Well, they're yeah. beautiful lights. So, <laughs> but you. this will be the gift shop filled with all sorts of incredible items to buy pertaining to arcade games and pinball machines. Right. But tell us now, how can be, people come over, play these games, get their hands on them here at the Museum of Pinball and Banning? Oh, thank you. Once a year we do uh, offer an event which is uh, quite a, kind of unique. Uh, it's mid-March around St. Patrick's Day, March 17th to the 19th. You can buy tickets online at uh, arcadeexpo.com. That's with two E's in the middle, Arcade mm -hmm. Expo. Or you can go to the museumofpinball.org. 
All right, and be yeah. part of it and be, be in this. Yeah. Is there a competition involved? It's just, uh, it is a competition? Sometimes we have a competition, but mostly it's people just coming down just to play the games. It's just a lot of fun. We have uh, food, we have entertainment, we have all the games to play, and uh, it's a great, day to, a great way to take the family and have an enjoyable uh, weekend. All right, well, yeah. you can see the website below mm -hmm. on the screen there. Mm -hmm. I'm signing up. Put my name down, John. Okay, you're, you're right. in there. <laughs> Folks, here we've been at the Museum of Pinball. John Weeks, thank you so much for thank having you, us Prince in here. Incredible thank facility. You. We'll be back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining me on Traveling with Francoise. I hope you enjoyed our adventure at the Whitewater Preserve, the Malachi Museum, and right here at the Museum of Pinball. Until next time, get out on the highways, and remember, it's never too late to get a life. Hey, want to travel? I'll take you there. Want to dine? I'll tell you where to play golf. I'll pick the spot and I like it. I know it's hot. It's never too late to get a life.